there's this thing, it's aliveness. What is that feeling to be alive? We see it, we feel it. I think everybody has that experience, I do. I don't know, I don't need to make it universal. But I just have these moments where I can feel the aliveness in the world around me. Think about that morning in the spring when the peepers first start. Or think about the middle of summer when you hear the crickets going. Like those are both being embedded in the aliveness of the world. But then coming in closer to home, I have this experience of being in groups with other people where there's an explosive aliveness. Playing music together when the groove is hit. I mean, there are sometimes in work environments, you go into a meeting and it's not one of those boring meetings where people say ideas come to die. It's the meeting where you are on, the, the purpose of your work together is active and you come out of there exploding into, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing this. There are moments in athletics, like when you're on a team and you just complete the path and you can see the hole and your other teammates and the rules of the game are there in play and it's just incredible joy. For me, it's ultimate frisbee. Like you just run and you catch that and you see that person and you dodge the other. It's just, it's, there's such an aliveness. And so the purpose of my work is to increase that in the world and to work to shift the ways in which the patterns that we've lived together have forced us into the deadening, into the alienation, into the drudgery. Somehow we've gotten ourselves into a place where we're on a spiral in the other way from aliveness. There's a lot of names for it. Supremacy consciousness, dominance hierarchies. Some people say capitalism in the world, they think it's that. Although some people think capitalism is the greatest thing in the world. What is it? What is that feeling of, oh, they call it the rat race. What is that? How is it that we've come to create patterns for how we live together that's a rat race? And we've even bought that that's like necessary. That's what the world looks like. Rats, they only do a rat race if you put them in a maze. Rats actually are pretty cool creatures if you don't put them in a maze. And, uh, they live a life like all the other creatures in the world of exploration and sure, sustenance, finding food, and but they have a sociality and a joy together, they play. They wouldn't be in a race if they weren't put in that place and I think that's true for us too. In 2000, my dad sent me a little manuscript called Money and Interest or something like that by Magritte Kennedy. And I read this thing and I'm like, holy crap. I didn't know that this is the way it worked. I didn't know that this was the pattern of our monetary system. And I didn't understand that that pattern, the way money is brought into existence on the basis of debt, I didn't realize the consequences of that. And so there was this explosion of, we create rules of engagement, rules of the game, that we play by, they're like at the bottom that you don't even see them and they spin out. And the consequences for all of our life together in the world are as astonishing over time. It's like the, the way it evolves out from those basic rules of the game. That was my aha moment and I'm like, wow. And because we created these rules of the game, we can create different rules of the game. But then, then the thing was, oh, and what if the rules of the game was a way of spinning out rules of the games? Like you jump a level, you increase the capacity to express new types of game together. Because just coming up with some new game is not gonna do it. That one is also gonna spin out one whole way that doesn't work well. So this was an intellectual moment for me, but it came from this, this realization of how we live together is so governed by what happens if you issue money on the basis of debt. 
and I'm not a conspiracy theory person. Like there are people over in the, out in the world who are Jekyll Island and uh, whatever, whatever, like that's baloney to me. I mean, sure, things happen. People conspire, but we don't live inside of a, a world of that. And we live in the world of flies landing on heads. <laughs> I know that was a big moment for me. Then my dad sent me another book. He sent me Bernard's book. And I read that and Bernard was like, as one of the architects of the Euro and seeing the collapses and all the rest as, as a natural consequence of this pattern and thinking about what other ways we could do this. And then my dad sent me a third book, Richard Douthwaite, An Ecology of Money, I think is what it was. And so then that led to a bunch of work on thinking about alternate patterns there. But then that made me realize that, oh no, it's, it really is this bigger game of what is the language what are the templates, the patterns by which we spin these things into existence? Like people really, we, we all have the experience of this in the realm of language. So we know that we can talk about a lot of different things. We can talk about our love lives. We can talk about doing the dishes. We can talk, we can create plans for the future. We can tell stories of the past. We can speak poems. All of these things live on top of what we call language. And I think we all recognize that it's possible to say a lot of the same things that we say in language other ways. And in fact, we see in the animal kingdom, we see in the rest of the world, that, that a lot of the same things are spoken about. Love life is spoken about. Warnings about things in the future are spoken about. You know, you have shrieks, you have cries, you have all these kinds of vocalizations, or you have changing body parts or raised feathers, you have these things. But those don't live in a generalized frame of language. Or if they, they, they don't live in as generalized a frame as language. They're much more one-off signal systems. And we can see the, the gradient, the range of how you can talk about things with individual signals, and then you can also talk about things because you've got an underlying thing we call grammar. Subject, predicate, object, right? You can actually use that to talk about so many things because we know what a noun is, what a verb is, uh, we have prepositions. That creates a composability of expression. The power of adding in a grammar then this capacity to share meaning together explodes because we have that grammar. And I would like to say that that pattern of a capacity exploding in power because there is something grammatic, that's the big deal. And so we can give more examples of that, right? Neurons, they're this, this incredible thing of being able to send a signal by, over a biological distance, like a large distance in a body. Neurons are used for all kinds of purposes in bodies. They're a kind of grammatic unit. You can see how having that assemblable unit is a grammatic unit that creates the capacity for large bodies to coordinate well. Money, the issuance of money, Debt mechanisms, interest, all these things are grammatical units for sharing value across space and time. People really like Alexander's pattern languages. This is the grammatics of how to create spaces that really work for people. So for me, then the question is, what is a grammatics of grammatics? How do you create grammars for lots of different purposes? That's what I wake up, get up out of, out of bed for, for that because it seems like that's where the power for change is. Every time in the history of the universe where there's significant change, it's because there's a new thing that is like that. I call it a grammatic capacity. And that's what DNA is. It's a grammar that expresses living beings into existence. And on top of the parts of DNA, the low level parts of DNA, there's other grammars that are built on top of that. Genomics, that's an assembly of a bunch of this smaller grammar for assembling proteins and creating little cells. But then there's grammars in, on top of that of genes that express traits inside that. And then there's complex interactions of these grammars that allow certain sections of that to be turned on with epigenetics. And we don't really understand all of it, 
but I am quite convinced that it is grammatic in shape. <clears throat> That's what keeps happening. So if you want it from the point of view of a story, think about this ball that we live on, floating in space, it looked one way, hard and cold. Then DNA came along. Now the, that cold, hard body is just like covered in fuzz. It's covered in life, on aliveness, and the whole planet has shifted. The planet was like, it's full of oxygen. This most toxic material that like is highly active, and that's because of life. Life is a geological force. That's big change. And then you can jump up the other stack. Humans and their own language, our, our ability to speak, that grammar is what creates culture and creates our ability to coordinate with each other, to play these social games together that have also allowed us to be the big operators on the planet. We are also a geological force. I learned that in sometime in the 60s, this was in my geology class in college, my professor said, I, I think it was the 60s, I don't remember the exact date, he said, there was that point is where humans started moving more physical material than all of the rivers in the world. We move more matter than all of the rivers in the world. You know, the Amazon, the Nile, the Tigris and the Euphrates, these are huge amounts of, of matter is moved down them. But we move more because we coordinate, because we have language. So if you want change, which I think we need if we want to survive, I, I think that most of us would agree that that's the case, then maybe it's time to have some kind of new grammatic capacity for coordinating and behaving together in ways that aren't self-terminating. So the universe already feels really alive to me if you just look at it from the point of view of supernovas and expanding galaxies. That, like It's such a beautiful thing, even without what we call life. It has this kind of be beautiful pattern and it operates according to the grammar of chemistry, according to the grammar of uh, all of that grammatics. I choose to look at it that way. Life, DNA, and genomics creates expression into being all of these different forms of biological beings that get to co-evolve together and create more and more explosion, more surface area, more places to play and invent how we fit together. That's what a thriving ecosystem seems to look like. And we know we know that it works because it's been here for it's been here for a billion years and it keeps expanding into stuff. It was very simple. It was an ocean full of algae for a while. And now it's a planet full of people doing all kinds of weird things and all of the other things around there. That feels like aliveness to me. But we know that it's also self-terminating because the pattern that we've used to expand across space is one of dominance hierarchies. It's a kind of the actual pattern of living together is a supremacy hierarchy that ends up collapsing a lot of the, <laughs> the fuel for aliveness. I don't know, the power. It gets centralized into the top of the pyramid. It's just, it's like, it's pretty obvious. That's what it looks like. And so for me, the question is how do we create something that is like DNA for biological organisms but for social bodies so that we're not just living by this one pattern of dominance hierarchies which is pretty much all we know how to do when the numbers get big the thing that i was saying at the before when we were talking about the aliveness of being in a jazz band or on a soccer team or sitting around the campfire singing or that kind of belonging, that togetherness that we feel, we really know how to do that well in small groups. We do not know how to do that in large groups. So you say, what does it look like? It looks like, <laughs> so here's a body, right? This is a trillion unit system, right? My cells are not in a supremacy hierarchy. They are in this uh, 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 collective, collaborative, collective intelligence that it doesn't put, doesn't pit the individual against the group. It's not a, it's not a sacrifice the individual to the group. It's not the the individual who gets supremacy over the group. The the ways in which we look at the competing of our political hierarchies tend to be around that dynamic. It's not that, it's kind of a, 
a place where being together and having agency are not at odds. So to me, that's what I'm looking for, is what is it that we can do? What are the patterns that allow us to express into being social forms, rules of engagement, so that that can evolve. Because I don't know what that looks like. It's an evolutionary process and it will keep expanding out, but we don't have an underlying substrate in which to express into being social organisms. Why is creating social fabric a response to the deadness of the world? It almost feels to me like the question, the answer to that question is self-evident. Like we live inside a social fabric. We live inside a social fabric. This social fabric means that I gotta earn a living. That is part of the rules of engagement. It's in the language. I gotta earn a living. Really? Is that the social fabric we should be living in? Let me try it a different way. I'm really suspicious of people who say, I know what the answer is. This is how we should be together. We should use Everybody should use sociocracy. If we all had circles where the other circle responds to the other thing, that would make it better. Or, I have the answer, I will make women safe. I am your strong man. Or, anarchy, we should all be doing whatever we wanna do, right? Those are all instances of examples of how to solve a particular problem. I don't trust any of them. I totally trust that in certain contexts and for certain people, that is the right answer. I get it. You are afraid of your job being taken away and you need somebody to protect you. You will respond to a person who's strong who will do that. That's right for you. I get it. You wanna participate at all these different levels and you wanna have lots of um, everybody being heard. Great. That's right for you, sociocracy. You wanna be able to be completely independent and run around and bounce off of the walls and live in an emergent spaces, I get it, that's right for you. Social fabric to me is the weaving together of all of these different ways of being such that things are coherent. And I don't know the answer of how to build that. Therefore, what must exist is a higher level context that allows us to experiment and evolve and play with these different forms in a coherent way. It's got to jump up a level. You have to be able to have a language, a grammar, in which to express these different forms of sociality so you can assemble them into being with some kind of constraints that they can then interoperate and work together. It's not gonna be, it can't be a free-for-all, You or it can, it is right now, right? You just have them and they get tumbled against each other. But if you have a grammatics, a sensible way, and you understand the, like what I like to use is the word dimensionality. If you understand the forms of what's different about these systems, like how much authority is there? How much freedom is there? How much, what types of connection are there? What are the forms of membranes uh, what, uh, in which people can enter in or out of a group? If you understand these questions that differentiate different types of social interaction, and then you create a grammatic space that holds those kinds of differences so that you can experiment and play with Okay, in our organization, we're gonna have three kinds of teams. We're gonna have a governance team that operates according to this. We're gonna have an evolutionary team that um, is finding and adapting to the environment. And we're gonna have another team that, you know, if you can actually build that together and you can represent it in tooling, that is weaving together social fabric. And that the, the space of being able to hold that together and know what the heck we're talking about, that, that seems to me like how it has to go because none of us knows the specific answer, but we can possibly see the ways of which we could express particular answers and have those particular answers play together and evolve that, that seems like it's where the solution goes. When you don't know the answer to a specific thing, you have to have a framework within which to play with possible solutions. That's what moves us from collective stupidity to collective intelligence the answer ar arises out of the experiments. Yeah. 
But the thing is, yeah, so if the answer arises out of the experiments, there has to be something that can contain experimentation that creates enough safety to do that. Also, so what we're talking about here is evolutionary capacity. How can systems grow? Well, my story is that evolution is a consequence of there being a grammar. So when there is a pattern, a template, that allows for constraint and expression, whether that is expressing biological beings into existence through DNA, or whether that is expressing molecules into existence through valence, electron bonding, or whether that is through expressing cultures into existence because people can talk, these are different levels of a grammar that allows kinds of expressions into existence. And then there's an ecosystem that will test those expressions against each other and different realities will emerge out of them. That's what evolution is. It is a creating of a fit, a fitting together inside a space of expression that comes from a particular grammatics that can hold and constrain those expressions. To me, I don't feel like this is a utopic vision. It's not like, oh, everything will be fine. Um, I won't have to go to work. I won't have to do things I don't like to do. It's not about that. I'm not sure quite why I want to defend against that, but I think a lot of times when we, when you say, what would it look like? The thing that we get is some kind of like dancing through the lilies and picking the fruit off the trees and so on. No, I think there will always be entropic struggles, right? The, the world falls apart and we are, we are collecting um, order from the world. We are taking, but there's this cycle of like what it feels to me like when you're together and you know that your contribution is useful, when you can be yourself, but you can belong. That kind of feeling is what I want at the large civic scale. That's what it would feel like. It's like, I can be myself and I can belong. I can contribute. I know where I can be responsible to, but it's not all on me. I'm part of it all holding. And I know that we have that experience. We have the experience of when that's the case. We have flashes of that. But it sure doesn't feel to me like that's what our sociality that we live in today is headed for. It feels like it's all designed around polarization, about us versus them. And that just doesn't feel good. I think what I want to do is I want to just tell the story of my story of looking at what what has happened with the evolution of the internet and what, what shows up for me. So when I look at the internet, which is a big word, right? A lot of things are inside that bubble. What is the internet? Well, for me, the core of what the internet is, is what's called the IP protocol, the internet protocol. That protocol, what was that, that led to what we have right now? Well, my story is that what that was is the first time on the planet when you could send a message from one place to another without there being a per message cost. Before that, there was always a per message cost, a telegram, a phone call. The cost might be you take it yourself and walk over. So your biological cost of moving from one place to another and even previous digital networks they would include in the protocol of sending a packet of data from one place to another, the cost, how many hops, whatever, that was part of the protocol. But the designers of the internet protocol through either conscious choice or serendipity removed pricing from the protocol. So what happened is that it was possible to send a message from one place on the planet to another place on the planet without there being a per message cost. And the cost is just simply 
having the infrastructure, owning the computers and being connected up to infrastructure. So there may be monthly costs. There's certainly the cost of buying the computer or you know whatever that was. In the early, early days of that, it was mostly an institutional costs that were bearing it. That was world changing. But interestingly, it's world changing mostly for technical folks because to create a specific use of that capacity was to use the internet protocol in some way and figure out what message you're gonna send over your packet. That was a technical task. So that was step one. Step two, give this capacity in general to everybody. How was that accomplished? Well, that was accomplished by building some protocols, technical protocols on top of the IP protocol and there's technical names for it. So for people who are technical, it was RFC 822, which was the internet message format protocol. It was SMTP, the simple mail transfer protocol. Those are the two critical ones, the built on top of IP. That meant that all of a sudden, everybody, as long as they had a computer and they had an email client, they could send a message to anybody else without there being a per message cost. That is a tremendous thing. Take the cost of something that's very valuable and move it from being something that is per message and charge and put it onto the infrastructure level. So that's fun. Part of what happens when you do that is people go, oh, this is really important. What is the ecosystem that surrounds that new capacity? And so most of us had the experience of joining at that time. If you were around in that time, you, you got on AOL or you got on Genie or you got on a number of other internet service providers, although they didn't even call themselves that really, or they kind of did, but they were giving you access to email this capacity and they were adding value around that. So my favorite example of this is AOL. It added all kinds of value around that. It added on AOL keywords and which got you to these rooms where they could charge companies to put their content into those rooms and you could see things and it looked kind of like the web looks today, but it was owned and managed by AOL and they had chat rooms, right? Also something that we have on the web now, but that was all owned and it was enclosed. It was value added around this open protocol. And it's so funny to me because the, the story keeps going here that AOL they thought they were a content company and they were so successful in this model um, that they were able to buy Time Warner, a content provider. So here we have this pattern. We have a open protocol, which is what most people really wanted about all these early internet service providers. And then you had other good value that was added around it. But what came next in this evolution? What came next was let's drop the price the, let's remove the per unit price from publication. Publication, like sending messages, used to be something that always had a per unit cost. You had a publisher that you would send your, your book to and they would create a book and print it out. And so you had to buy a book, it's per unit cost. Or you have an advertisement or any of, anything that you wanted to publish to the world was a per unit cost. That was dropped to zero by an addition on top of the internet protocol, then this is three more protocols. HTTP, which we all type in front of our URLs, the hypertext transfer protocol. HTML, the hypertext markup language. And the URL, the, the, the universal resource locator that points to a web page that allows them to be accessed. Those three things drop the price of publication to just the infrastructure. Changed the world, this pattern. We're in the middle of a phase that's kind of like the phase where AOL thought it was a content company, where a bunch of companies have added value around this set of protocols known as the web, HTML, HTTP, and the URL, plus a bunch of other ones that also evolved to make that better. We're in the phase where another really critical capacity is being provided by companies who can charge for it, who for whom they can enclose that value. 
Just the same way that AOL thought that it can enclose the value of publication and make that be its own special sauce and make tons of money off of it, but that was broken up by the web. We're in the phase right now where there is a whole host of companies that have done a very similar thing. Now, what is that thing? What is that value that is super valuable that these companies have put in the middle because it doesn't exist in an open protocol? That value, that pattern, is this ability to work together and to collaborate together. The capacity to publish documents is a very interesting one because one of the things that you can publish inside those documents is computer code. And so we can make our web browsers do all kinds of really interesting things that are really useful to us because a company can publish computer software that um, creates all kinds of really useful tooling. So let's think about Google and the way it's given us Gmail and Google Suite and Google Drive and uh, Google Docs. There's all this ability to work together in Google Suite and to collaborate together that they have provided because you can ship that as software to your web browser and use it. Similarly, think about a bunch of the other collaboration tools that, exi that exist out there. In business, if you, use, if you want to do uh, project management, you might be using Trello or Jira. These are companies that have taken this ability to work together and ship the software through the ability of the web to publish that software to your browser and interact. But here's the trick. Here's the thing. Those companies are sitting in the middle of your social group or the team or whatever group of people are trying to operate by the rules of engagement that that capacity of that software affords. So just like AOL sat in the middle of providing content, the most valuable companies in the world are sitting in the middle of providing spaces for social engagement. So the next step in the evolution is to create an open protocol that removes that cost or that removes that enclosure by an intermediary and puts that back down on the infrastructure. And that's what we've done with Holochain. Holochain is like the IP protocol, but instead of about sending messages to individuals at the technical level, Holochain is about creating a space of, for rules of engagement that is held by the players who are playing by those rules of engagement. No intermediary. Out of that capacity, all right, no longer a cost to be paid for doing that. And just a little um, a side note on the cost. I was using the per message cost or the per publication cost before, thinking about, you know, you pay a dollar, a stamp for that. There are many forms of cost. In the world that we play in right now with websites, the cost is usually not dollars for most of us who are just using Gmail. It's not, that's not where the cost lives. For companies, it usually is dollars, right? For a company that a group of people at any scale, usually larger than 20 or 30, then they start saying, okay, now you gotta pay a per seat cost for all of your employees because they know where the money is. But for us who are not, for those of us who are not in a company and we're not paying the cost of Trello or Jira or GitHub or whatever on a per seat basis, we're paying the cost because we are the product. We get either advertised to or our information gets sold to other people for other purposes. And that experience is, it's, it takes a while to have it feel and land, but it starts to land really powerful how expensive that is in other forms than money for us. And similarly in, in the AOL case, right? End users, they just paid a monthly cost to have access to everything, but they were being advertised to through AOL. It's a similar cost there. Okay, but back to the story about Holochain. When you create a technical protocol that removes the intermediary from being able to charge costs or take value, either by charging actual money or by extracting value from your personal information or 
allowing you to become a target of advertising and to be controlled. Extract so there what's being extracted is your attention and your agency. Attention and agency are literally being stolen and taken from you because it's so valuable to be able to do things like use Google Docs and Google Spreadsheets and Gmail. So we're willing to pay that cost. That's okay, right? I, like it's okay to a certain point. Like it was totally fine that we were always using stamps and paying for telephone calls and paying for our packages to be delivered. That was great when we couldn't do this other thing. But as soon as you can do the other thing, when you can bring the cost down to the infrastructure cost of these critical capacities, wow. Different worlds come out of that. So there's more to go on this, right? Because Holochain as a technical protocol that does that is a lot like IP as a technical protocol that does messaging. It's not that convenient or it's really left there for technical people to be able to then take, okay, I'm going to build a particular unit of rules of engagement and then I'm gonna build a user interface on top of that. And so there's not the assemblable framework for putting that all together in the same way that IP is not the same as email. So the next layer is building that, and that's called the weave. So what's the difference between the capacity to send messages and putting that onto the infrastructure and the capacity to publish and putting that onto the infrastructure? Well, messages are really point to point. That is, I'm sending a message from this computer to the other computer. An IP packet has a destination where it goes to. And I guess, you know, if you want to get technical, there are other things where you can put, multi, it's called multicast, you can have a couple things, but it's really about, there's this one thing and it goes from one computer to the next computer. And in email, it's kind of similar. You can put a couple different people in the header, right? But it's, it is about getting a message from one place to another place. Publication, publication is about having an address, a location at which anybody can go and look at what's there. It's a different thing. Like when I publish a book, the notion is that that book is in the library or in bookstores. When there's an advertisement that's published on billboards, it's like it's there in the world and people can go see it. And, and so part of what's powerful about the particularity of how the publication infrastructure was built and why the web is such a great thing is that it unites transport getting messages from one place to another, like me being able to request something, a standardization of what it is that I'm requesting. That is the URL, http colon slash slash, theweave.social, whatever it might be, holochain.org. That is an address at which there are resources that I can retrieve from that. And then HTML is a standard format for there being all kinds of content there. There can be an image there, there can be an audio file, there can be text there, there can be software there in, in the form of JavaScript, and there's all kinds of other standards that make that be something that my web browser will be able to interpret when it pulls the message back. IP, anything could be in the IP packet. There's nothing that tells what the data is. It's sp specifically left out. Email is like, wait, let's make a little bit more constraint and say this is what it's gonna look like. There's gonna be a subject, and then there's gonna be a body. I don't know what's in the body, it's just a pile of text. So when you jump to the next level up with the capacity to create rules of engagement, to create social spaces, engagement spaces, places where there is social reality in the sense that we know what we're doing together. Well, then you have to add more constraint on top of that. You have to start with what are the rules of the game? And that's exactly what Holochain does. Every time that you join a social space, the first thing that you do is you say, these are the rules of the game that we're all playing by. And this is the technical means by which we, we can actually do this. The rules of the game are held by everybody. They all, everybody who starts to play together knows what the rules of the game are, and Holochain creates the technical protocol that adds in that capacity of playing a so, engaging socially or in, engaging according to some set of rules. And then the social fabric comes up out of using lots of those little units of engagement and weaving them together. 
So earlier in our conversation, I said I'm not a person who really engages in conspiracy theories. Um, like that seems like the wrong frame to look, look at things through. However, when you're playing by rules, well, when you've created social fabric and there are rules of the game, and when you've increased your capacity to play together by having large numbers of people and you have handed over the capacity to, to uh, to basically do accounting, to track things, <laughs> you know, when you've handed over social benefit to an intermediary, that intermediary can collude to hide information, to change the rules that make it hard for you to get benefit, can enclose that capacity for their own benefit because they're selfish, but they can also try to just make it better and better and better by increasing the amount of resources that they use to make things better. That's a thing that happens that's very, very well-meaning. It's bureaucratic bloat. It's adding more staffing in to make sure that we're taking care of your tax dollars. We care about that. In the meantime, you've spent all of your tax dollars on taking care that we're not using our tax dollars well, right? That's, it's like there are processes that happen when you have this, in, when, you, when you are required to expand by having an intermediary. And so where would AOL have gone? If we didn't get the web for publishing, how big would it have been able to grow and say, have an editorial board that says, well, we're not gonna have this AOL keyword because it doesn't fit our desires. That's one of the problems of having publishing happen with always an intermediary is that control of the narrative gets held by the intermediary at some level or another. Therefore, the rules of the game are also held by and controlled by the intermediaries who create spaces for us to do rules of the game together. As well-meaning as they may be, if there isn't an underlying capacity for those people who want to play the game to be able to play that game directly without an intermediary, the evolutionary direction is different. Decentralization is not the answer to everything. Um, there's always specialization, but it's curious like what well, so for me, what I would want to say is, what is the grammatics of this? Do we even know? When do we necessarily want intermediaries or not? Do we have the capacity to express intermediaries into existence when we want them and unexpress them out of existence when they turn out to be not so good for us? And what are the patterns by which we can even detect that that's the case and measure that kind of impact? And so I would say that until you have a grammatic capacity that itself is disintermediated, so that we can be bringing those kinds of bodies into existence and playing with them, we won't know the answer. Because frankly, we don't know the answer. Curation is a critical capacity. Moderation is a critical capacity. We know what happens now that we've lived for quite a while with an internet in which unmoderated spaces devolve into, well, troll land, right? We know that that's sucky. And so people move to moderated spaces where they're not just going to get bombarded. So for example, with, with, in Holochain, when you're creating a suite of um, these little units of rules of engagement, you can create some that are hyper centralized. And you can say inside these rules of engagement, this one person has all the control. And to play the game, it's to ask this person what the next move is, right? That's actually really appropriate. For example, in the case of fires, we have chains of command because it's so hard to know what to do if everybody's running around. You want to have the fire chief saying, you go there, you go there, you go there, and let go of that decision because that person can see everything. It's really great to step into chains of command in that kind of an emergency. But you don't wanna let the fire chief then become the police chief and also the judge and also the president because that's silly. So the question is what is our capacity to play by all kinds of rules of engagement, all kinds of times with intermediation and not intermediation for different purposes. But so far, the tech always required intermediation. So you always have that. The tech being pen and paper, you didn't have the underlying affordances of um, cryptographic public key, public private key signing, all these things that we are now using to be able to make this work well on a technical basis. Okay, so if you have an underlying capacity to be able to create rules of engagement and run those rules of engagement, so this is the abstract thing, right? This is like the IP protocol, but for social interaction. 
And and social interaction, let's not like social interaction is it makes it feel like it's Twitter or Instagram. That's not what I mean by social interaction. What I'm really talking about is this the sociality, the wider fabric of being collectively intelligent together and coordinating together. And so let's use this term rules of engagement. There's lots of different types of rules of engagement that one might have. Just like the IP protocol lets us have protocols for sending email and sending um, web packets to browsers. Yeah, so that's there's a lot of different classes of messages that you want to send. There's a bunch of different classes and types of rules of engagement. And so if we're going to make something that is accessible, where that's going to take this capacity to have rules of engagement be held by the infrastructure and not be um, encapsulated or proxied to the intermediary of the web server, the company who owns the web server. Instead, all of us together who happen to have the computers, we start playing by these rules and they all operate together and share the data. That's what the Holochain does. But how do you create an integrated fabric that's really easy to use? Well, that's what we've done with the Weave. In the same way that the web is the name that we have for the whole cascade of protocols and processes that allow us to go to web browsers and pull data from everybody's web servers all over the world and, um, and be able to run all of these different cool things that live on the web. The Weave is like that. It's a set of technical protocols for bringing this capacity of weaving together different types of rules of engagement, the being, the doing, and the, the sourcing. So let's think about that in terms of our ability to act together collectively. What would it look like to have the similar frame and tooling that allows us to join groups, basically cross the membrane of different types of groups that we want to be part of, create new groups that we want to be part of, spin them up when we're, we want to create a new group, oh, youth, us, us who are here together working on this interview, we need to be in a group and plan it out. Let's have the three of us be in the group and do all the planning. Well, what are we gonna do? Oh, well, we need a bunch of different tools there that, that do different things. We need a Kanban board to organize. We need a chat to be able to start talking when we're uh, apart from each other and we're um, just doing interacting. We need some documents where we can draft out what we're gonna draft out and we can drop those into a space. Like imagine if it was that easy and in all of these cases, there's no website to go to, there's nobody to spin up a web server, you don't need all of that intermediary capacity to create the social space for doing this particular activity. That is what the weave does and provides. So in the same way that the web, you can use a web browser where you might use Firefox or Chrome to get access to the web and all those materials. In the Weave, we, we call it a frame. Like there's a web browser and there's a Weave frame that allows you to start playing this game together. And the first frame that we built, we're calling Moss, just because Moss is a soft space to land and it's beautiful and it creates surface area for interaction. So Moss is a place where you can go and you can spin up a group. And you can pick tools, so the group is a space of being. Who are we? Who are the people who are in there? You can add people into the group. And then you can also add in tools, which each one of them is a small unit of rules of engagement. That's what we do together. And you can pull those tools from libraries, which is also a, rule, a space of rules of engagement because in those libraries, there's a way of saying, I like this one, thumbs up. There's a way of curating and moderating what's in the library because just having a bunch of crap in there wouldn't work well. So you see these are weaving together the types of ways in which we create social fabric. We are together, we do together in teaming in small groups, and then we have spaces where across all groups, we also have resources and things that we want to um, participate in. Libraries are one, but there are also sources of things like equivalent to the Wikipedia. There will be rules of engagement for sharing knowledge that again, don't need to be held by central servers. I've spun it up in my family to be able to do planning at the family level and there's no web server out there that I have to go set up or anything like that. I just, we put it on our two computers and boink, it's working. And we can like 
do our little planning board or have a little chat. It's pretty exciting. One of the awesome things that the weave affords is actual transclusion. What is transclusion? Transclusion is when you can take an element of one tool, one bit of tooling, and you can include it inside another bit of tooling. So the way we have it, the way it works, is that when you're a tool builder, what you do is you build assets. So let's take the example of a Kanban board. In a Kanban board, you have the board with your different columns, backlog, to be prioritized, doing and done. So you have the columns and then you also have the cards. All three of those can be assets. An asset can then be taken and transcluded into any other place where there's an attachment point in any other tool. So that means if I have a chat stream and I'm like, how are we doing in preparing for the interview? And here's the Kanban card and I can transclude it right in there so you can check off the check marks that are inside that card. That is something that currently cannot be done well in the web. It can be done a little bit. People have the feeling of I can transclude and embed a YouTube video. But it is not built into the protocol that that's how you do everything. There's people are gonna argue with me and say, hey, that's what an iframe is. An iframe lets me put anything anywhere I want. But it's not the same if the the whole fabric of the rules of engagement are set up such that you can create these little bits of assets as a, co as a coherent unit and attach them wherever you want in any other um, space that you're a part of. So that is a really, I'm just, what that's looking like and the utility that comes out of that, the composable capacity is astronomical. It's really pretty great. In the current world, when you want to include something from one place into another, the web site developer has to create what are called integrations. And so an integration often is what you pay for. So you pay for the capacity to integrate in your Trello board a Slack conversation or vice versa. Slack does an integration and this requires communication between business entities who are saying this is how you do this or very careful crafting of an API and usually then also authentication mechanisms that allow you to be able to get access to your Slack group inside your tele Telegram group or inside your Trello board. That is a complex process and is usually again part of what you pay for. In the Weave, integrations are integrated, right? That is actually what it does for you already. And so transcluding anything and anything else is automatic. When you build a Weave tool and you create the, the coherent asset units, they are, will be automatically transcludable in anything else. There is no extra step of creating an integration. So I'm really excited because we have built so far an early beta, early alpha, whatever you want to call it nowadays, version of Moss. And you can spin up a group inside Moss and we're, we use it for the development of Moss itself and our team. And inside that group, you can add in all kinds of different tools. Right now we have a video chat thing that we use for our meetings. We have a text chat that's kind of like Slack or Mattermost or many of the other for being able to do asynchronous texting together. We have a Kanban board. We have a thing that's like Google Docs for typing out documents. And so, and adding these, adding new tools, new capacities to the group and adding that into the library that all groups can choose from is relatively simple. So that's growing very quickly. We have some of them, some of these tools that are about governance, about finding out, creating alignment, some that are for planning, um, creating dependency trees. So all kinds of tools. And what's super cool about it is that not only can you create those little tools, but parts of the tools you can embed in other parts of the tools. What does that mean? It means that if you're a person who's building a video chat tool, you don't have to have build the commenting one. You can just drop in a comment thread from your commenting tool, from your chat tool. It means that you don't have to say, oh, wouldn't it be nice if our video chat system had collaborative text editing in it and we have to add that in it too. 
No. There's an unnamed uh, tool that has just done that. I'm not going to say its name. But you don't have to do that in this context because it already exists. You can just drop it into your group. So the consequences of creating an ecosystem for building software shifts as a result of that. And we're already seeing the power of that in just using it for our own teams. It's really cool. How many times have you had this feeling of, I'm using this tool and they changed it out from under me? Or how many times have you felt, if I could only, I just love this, uh, this, I love the way this tool works and I like how I type in it. If I could only type my documents using this, my favorite editor, and put it here. But I can't because they didn't do it for me. It doesn't exist on the website. Well, in this frame, there's no, you're not, there, you're not sending to an intermediary the capacity to do your rules of engagement. Rules of engagement are, I like to type text editor boxes. I like to do, those are a form of rules of engagement. That's not held out in the intermediary. It is assembled by the group who wants to use that. So what it feels like is they don't have control over how this looks and how it feels. I can put it together myself. Now, not everybody in your team or your group is going to do that. You're going to have people who love to do that and assemble that for you. But it's done at your group level. It's not done at the app level. So the way of thinking about that is the silo, which right now is the web app, into which the people who are building the web app have to put in everything. And so you see all of these collaborative tools that have all the same things in it. It's the kitchen sinkification of each one of them. That silo can be thankfully removed into the parts where the group gets to decide how it wants its collection of doing to look like and feel like. I mean, so this totally changes the dynamics of building software, right? Because what we end up thinking about is how to make the parts excellent because we know that the groups are gonna assemble the parts. It's not me, the developer of the app, who's assembling the parts. The group gets to assemble the parts. So from the perspective of the group who's using this collection of tools that are assembled, they can just go look at what are the parts that I can drop in here? Instantly add that in. They don't have to submit a, a request and say, could you please add into my Miro board the ability to do voting? Like, no. Voting can just be its own component and then you can attach it where you need it. People have been trying to do this for a long, long time, by the way. It's not a new thing. It, but the thing is, it's really, really hard to do until you have an underlying capacity to have rules of engagement be held by the infrastructure instead of having to have the rules of engagement held by an intermediary. So as soon as you flip to that other model, then it becomes possible. People have been trying to make it cheap to send messages for a long time. It wasn't that expensive, a stamp. You can do that, it's awesome. But it's really different when it doesn't work that way, when all of a sudden sending messages is just owning a computer. Same thing with this capacity to collaborate, to work together, to engage in some form of rules of engagement. And I, I really do wanna stress that this isn't just about teams playing together. There are all kinds of rules of engagement where like tracking value together across an ecosystem, doing economic activity together. I'm starting there, I'm not saying money because money is just one solution for how do we do economic activity together? How do we watch how the things we produce are become made available and can be transformed by another entity in the value chain. And can we track that? And can we create this network of flows of value together with whatever set of incentives or reciprocity or coordination? That is also sets of rules of engagement that aren't just about creating a team here or a team there and then using your video chat inside that team. So in the Hudson Valley, there's a group called the New York Textile Collaborative, I believe, and they are very interested in being able to weave together the, the supply chain of local farmers producing wool to getting the wool carded, to getting it spun, to be getting it turned into yarn, to moving that and make that available to um, 
designers to do sweaters or other types of garments to getting that to the knitting machines to getting that out into the into the hands of uh, consumers. That's a whole flow of value across an ecosystem and they are wanting to use the Weave for a specific application that's, that's been built to actually track that using what's called REA, which is a form of accounting that is not about enterprise accounting, which is what we have in double um, double entry bookkeeping, but instead using this other form of accounting that was invented in the quite a while ago. That's basically cross enterprise accounting. That tool is available to be, there's an experimental tool to be used by them. Um, and I'm really excited about that one. The stage we are at right now is that we can use it ourselves. And there are a few early players who are using it in their own offices and groups who are early testers. But this is the phase where we don't know how it should look and how it should be built. And so we are very excited to co-create the tool so that it actually works for people who want to use it. And that's our, our goal. Our goal is to land the initial groups of people who are willing to take some of the pain of using a tool like this in their early days for the benefit that it provides and co-build it with them. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that what I'm hoping that this provides is a different way of operating together. People like to say a different operating system, but I'm a little afraid of using, uh, like taking the operating system metaphor from computers and applying that because it feels a little, I don't know, but it's also good, right? So, but the thing is how we operate together, where the capacity for operating together holds at its core our relational fabric, how we can relate with each other. I have the experience that many people are suffering from the hyper-individuality of American culture. And also there are many people who are very proud of the individual agency of my freedom. And there is a kind of dignity and power in that. Like I'm, I get to act, I get to have agency. And then I watch the suffering that people have of disconnectedness of families, of feeling afraid to let their children go and play in the neighborhood. And all like, it's a crazy contradiction to me. It seems like people want their autonomy and their individuality. They're so they're holding that tightly. I can feel myself holding that tightly. I want my freedom to be an individual agent and act in the world. And I suffer from the fact that I'm an individual agent who has to go and choose from so many of the same things in the supermarket that have no difference. And that's pushed on me as if it was choice rather than a shallow kind of agency. And so it's hard. It's hard to know what how to hold that, but it feels to me like what has happened to us is some kind of social fabric that is broken, that doesn't take the relational necessity of humans to be able to be together in deep aliveness and has instead stacked us on top of each other in a hierarchy of value and pitted us against each other in ways that are just painful. It's just what it feels like to me. I gotta be afraid of you coming across the border. And then, and then it's crazy. Then you have a natural disaster and we care for each other. We just reach out and care. And we do that anyways. Even though right next, the next thing we're doing is we're out in the market competing as if reality were always cutthroat. No, it's kind of I, like the social fabric is constructed for that. So we think it's that way. It's a side effect. Like the thing that's landing for me as the most challenging in getting to this goal is, is actually the technical challenge it's incredibly difficult to get it right. Like technically for you to be able to run a system where the rules of engagement are held collectively and the 
playing by the rules is also held collectively without resorting to a central authority, a central place to go put the data. Like, think about this as a technical challenge. How do you actually make it be the case that you get the, the actions that people take in any set of rules of engagement? The, tra the monetary transaction, I want to transact with you. The, I'm going to enter a piece of text into a document that you're also entering in at the same time. Right? When you don't have somebody in the, in the middle to say, this is the reality, this is what it looks like, that's technically really challenging. I mean, there's names for this. It's called the Byzantine generals problem in some parts of the literature. And our way of dealing with that, well, we have a technical solution for it, but it's, it's hard to land and get it to really work right. Like we know how it will work. We know theoretically how it will work, but actually getting the details exactly right, so it does, it's been hard. It's taken many years. That's one of the challenges. There, there's something that needs to be said about the social challenges. Like, <laughs> so one of the challenges of getting this to work this way is that there are people who are so clearly aligned with the, with the fact that the way the world is operating is completely wrong. It's a dead end, it's self-terminating. And they are like, oh, this is right. This is the way it needs to go. And then, including myself, and then I prematurely try to make it work in some way that's beyond the way it works right now that can't actually be held yet. You know, and this includes like, the usual question is, well, how are you paying for it? How are you funding it, right? Well. So we figure out what mechanisms of funding, but then that brings in all of the energy of the supremacy hierarchies and the power dynamics that are built into our current system at scale that actually are kind of coherent, they work, but that's the part that makes people feel horrible. They make people feel like tools and they feel alienated. And so the context of working together feels bad. And if part of what we're looking for is a context of working together that just feels better and more alive, and we're not there yet, and we know we might get there, it feels doubly bad because you're supposed to be able to live in this great way. You like, like there's the, the, I could almost get there. And so then you build something and somebody does a move, like I might do a move and have done a move that is power over somebody else. And they're like, that sucks. How could you do that? You're holding this ideals. Yeah, that's a challenge. It feels really bad to get that kind of thing wrong. I don't know, man, it's a long-winded of, of way of saying one of the challenges is that you have ideals and you can't live up to them and then you disappoint people. And that really hurts. So one of the big challenges in this work is crossing thresholds of usability. It feels like the threshold of usability is just around the corner and then you cross it and it turns out that there's another issue that makes the tooling unusable. And so you can have it at some low level, the thing is finally working right, but then the user interface is like terrible, or you're missing some other piece. So, and then it's very easy to make mistakes around thinking that there are too, that you need too many things to cross the threshold of usability. So that advice of making it as simple as possible, but no simpler is so, difficult because oftentimes we make it simpler than is possible for it to be successful because it's so challenging to make, make that one threshold. And then other times we're like, no, for it to work, we have to have all these things which turn out to be baloney. You only needed to have one thing. So landing as simple as possible, but no simpler is a huge challenge. So many people have had this insight, shared this insight that that the tools that we use shape us as much as we shape the world with the tools that we use. And of course, the you know the usual one is if you have a hammer, every problem is a nail. To me, I think that it's just so clear right now how we are being shaped by the tool that is called the web. Like that tool is shaping political discourse and it's shaping it 
because of its structure, right? Its structure is that we go to Facebook to find out about what our families are doing, but in the meantime, we get doom scrolled and we get ads placed in, placed in there. So we become a product and it's like, it's structural. There's a structural reality that because the value of being able to connect with our family and know what our friends and family care about is being held by an intermediary who gives that to us for free in exchange for them being able to pop a couple of things into our mind is a way that the narrative of the world is being constructed in our minds. We are being shaped by the fact that we use this tool to learn about our friends and family for free because our attention gets taken by advertisers for products, advertisers for political attention, and we know all about how foreign interests are controlling your kids by TikTok. We are gonna make a law against that. Mm, yeah, maybe, that might actually be really true, but is it really the foreign interests? It's like, who's actually doing that manipulation with those tools? And it's the structure of the tool that leads to us being changed in that way. So it behooves us to pay a lot of attention to the structure of the tool. Similarly, if you are sending messages and you have to pay a per unit cost and somebody has control over that cost and also can say what you are or are not allowed to send in a package and that first class mail letters can only be sent through the US postal system. They may not be sent through any other system. There's a monopoly on that. Why? Oh, get into conspiracy theory. No, it's not that. It's like there are these consequences to what happens by the rules of having an intermediary be able to take advantage of a specific capacity or is necessary for the capacity to occur. Our tools shape us. Yeah. Especially in the realm of creating social fabric, in creating the rules of engagement, the people who want to play a certain way, if they must always have that be intermediated, there will be consequences. I'm not saying what they will be. There can be all kinds of consequences. Maybe it's good consequences because that will be somebody's checking to make sure that people aren't playing together in bad ways by the wider society's rules. Okay, but also not. All of the ways that we might be able to play together and collaborate and solve our problems without having to resort to the intermediary are disallowed as a result. There's this fascinating thing in this realm of sociality. It's called deviance, right? What is considered socially deviant? How much variety can the society handle and still stay coherent and healthy together? The more deviance you can hold and still stay coherent, the better. If you can't remain coherent, if you start falling apart at the seams because there's too much deviance, all right, there's a problem there. But the more you can handle, the more internal complexity you can embody, the more you will be able to withstand and adapt in times of difficulty and change, the more that's allowed, the more creativity that's possible. It feels to me like the more aliveness will be inside that body. Its degree of complexity is held and alive because of how much things can be different from each other while still co being coherent and playing together. Freedom, accountability, belonging, you get to be yourself in a context of accountability to others, you therefore belong. What a positive spiral up. <laughs>